Hello and welcome to our Safeguarding Children with SEND podcast series. I am your host and founder of About Safeguarding, Madeline Dunkley, and today we are speaking to Harry Welsh. Good afternoon, Harry. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for joining us. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your school? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you said, my name is Harry Welsh. Um, I'm the Assistant Head of School and DSL at the River Dart Academy in Dartington, which is in Devon. So I've been in education for eight years and been in educational leadership for around about five years. Um, I recently joined River Dart Academy uh, at the beginning of January as the Assistant Head of School and DSL, um, which is a secondary PRU um, and is the day six provision for the local authority. On roll, we have around day about... Day six, sorry, what's day six? So day six is day six after permanent exclusion. Ah, oh, OK. All right. Thank you. Didn't know that. No, no problem. Um, so we have 40 pupils um, on roll as a maximum and around about 65 percent of that pupil cohort either have educational health care plans or receive SEND support for primary area of need of SEMH. So prior to being at the River Dart Academy, I was in post as the lead for behaviour in DSL for over seven years as specialist secondary provision in Torbay. Um, whereby all of the pupils had educational health care plans and all with a primary area of need of SEMH. But alongside that, a lot of the young people there also had secondary area of needs such as um, autism or sort of ADHD, speech language cognition. So real complex young, young people there. So to context the academy, we're based in the South Devon. Um, there's some real areas of affluence um, near us. However, there are significant places whereby there's high levels of deprivation. We're part of the WAVE Multi Academy Trust, who have a number of um, schools across the Southwest, ranging from all through APs to medical provisions. The trust itself is very trauma informed, and the trust um, in Cornwall specifically have done a lot of work around this approach. Um, however, this is still a developing and emerging piece of work that myself and other senior leads are doing at the River Dart Academy and working across Devon schools with that too. Brilliant. Thank you. So if we dig in a little bit further uh, around uh, with your children with SEMH, could you tell us about how you safeguard children with those needs? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's really important to recognise that safeguarding children with SEMH is inherently more challenging than those who do not have identified additional needs. Yeah. SEMH children um, means that children can often struggle to communicate their thoughts, feelings, emotions and often struggle to meet their own basic needs. So safeguarding children with SMH is certainly a process and takes a significant amount of time to build relationships between the adult and the child. At this point, this is when we'll start to see those sort of significant disclosures start to come through when they really trust us. So it's important that as adults, we try to bridge the gaps in communication and that children have the ability to share when they are ready to share. As adults working with children with SEMH, it's important for us to be alongside them and advocate them. And I mean be alongside them in its truest sense. So it's recognised that we build strong relationships, you know, when things are going really well. But I think we really do build the strongest relationships during times of real difficulty and adversity because they sh you're, they're able to see who's there for them, who, can, who they can trust and sort of who will act when they say they will act. And you, you talked a bit about, you know, building those trust, trust relationships. How, how, did, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So we link in a lot of sort of trauma and adversity um, yeah. informed approaches with, with a lot of the work that we do. Yeah. Building a real relational approach, we look at that PACE model of that playful, accepting, curious and empathetic as a base model of how we interact. And then alongside that, we incorporate the trauma-informed school model of I wonder, I noticed, um, I imagine, and empathy alongside that. And that is sort of what we what we do and what yeah. we say. And alongside that, that, that builds a real relational approach to show that adults are in fact safe, show that adults aren't harmful to them, and shows that they can share when they are ready to share. And so when it comes to the safeguarding concerns, are there any barriers that comes with, with the trauma, especially? Yeah, absolutely. So there are really, really clear links between SEMH, trauma and attachment, which can make safeguarding these young people very, very challenging. I think it's important to recognise that those who have suffered trauma may have had negative experience and exposure to unsafe adults mm. that instead of being caregivers, they're often perpetrators of significant levels of harm. 
I think we need to recognize this and recognize this as a profession, as a, as a group of adults, and then act to build strong, authentic relationships with children to help change the narrative around what adults can be. So I advocate for all of our staff to be emotionally available adults at all times and to hold the children with unconditional positive regard. Link, we do a lot of work linking towards Carl uh, Rogers' core conditions, which is a counselling um, theory. However, it translates really nicely into education. So then once we've built those authentic healing relationships and connections, it's at this point where children will then start to share their story. They need a lot of time for this. However, once we've given them that significant amount of time and shown that we can be safe, this is when their real story and truth comes out. Right. So when they do disclose, is, is there any like similar patterns that occur? You know, when they communicate, what, what does that look like? Yeah, I think working with young people with SMH, you can sort of see a similar pattern and trend, especially when some of those young people are holding on to some really big disclosures. Um, so often it's always part of a bigger picture. They often leave little tiny breadcrumbs um, that they drop over the time and they want to see how the adults will react. So something that may appear relatively small will be part of something really, really big to them. Um, so they drop that little breadcrumb to see how we'll act, whether we will take action, whether we will listen to them, whether we'll believe them, whether we'll actually truly keep them safe in its broadest sense. So sort of an example of this would be a young person being very quiet and withdrawn, then all of a sudden having real high level, harmful, self-sabotaging sort of behavioural outbursts. If the adult specifically contain that situation, both physically and psychological, and build safety, the child sees actions, sees that we care as adults and sees that we can safeguard them. Over time, as staff, when we remain inquisitive, you know, always thinking about what the communication is behind the behaviour rather than looking at a punitive draconian model and always adopting the approach of it could happen here. The child then begins to feel safe and held and then begins to share their story. And what happens if a staff member doesn't show any action? At that point, that, that, that's a very, very harmful, harmful approach for the adults to take. Yeah. The young people close up. Yeah. And what they will do is we can often see the young people then displaying that harmful behaviour towards that adult yeah. and towards that person who they just don't feel safe with. And there's a difference between saying, I'm with you, you're safe, I care about you, yeah. versus actually truly showing that. Our young people often see many different faces in their life some of which they don't know whether they're safe or unsafe people, we show that purely by our actions. So actions are louder than words, as they yes. say. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so you talked about this slightly earlier. You talked about um, building uh, partnerships with your academy trust and outside agencies. Do you want to talk about that a bit further? Yeah, so I think it's really important to recognise that these are absolutely vital. I think that the time that I've been designated safeguard in Leeds and working across different organisations and multi-agencies, that is when we can then truly have the most impact at safeguarding young people. It just can't be effective unless it's done in collaboration. You know, the young people in schools are with us, you know, six, maybe seven hours a day. And there's a significant amount of time when they're not with us. So, you know, while we can be there for them and their families, you know, during holidays and outside of school time, we have to allow, we have to be supported by the multi agencies to make sure that we are truly capturing this young person and their family more often than not. I think it's, you know, really important that as multi agencies, we work to join up and bring all these pieces of the puzzle together. You know, I've had many conversations with, with other professionals, other schools, other colleagues, mm -hmm. that that little one, you know, that one little breadcrumb can help to bring all of that big piece of picture together. And then that's when that really big piece of safeguarding work happens. Yeah. I think it's really important as well is that it's, it, it's important sometimes for us to recognise the amount of potency we have within situations as educational professionals um, there are times where we have to be bold and brave and we have to hold other agencies and other people to account yeah. and and this is you know this is to purely safeguard 
all of our young people and families, you know, there will be times where we disagree and I would urge professionals within their authorities to, to use their professional differences policy, their escalation policy, to make sure that the child and the children and their families are being held at the centre of what everything that we do. I think that this can be difficult, but we need to make remain subjective within this. You know, the most important thing during all of this is the children. Absolutely. Have you, have you come across any barriers with any outside agencies? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, there, there are times whereby agencies don't necessarily see the same picture that we see. And we'll put in we'll put in a mass referral and we'll go through, you know, section 17 assessment or section 47 assessment. But we're not we're not quite getting to the outcome that that, that we believe is appropriate. And there have been a number of times in in a different local authorities whereby we've had to put in that professional escalation and professional differences. And more often than not, we, we do get to, you know, to an amicable conclusion whereby we are all happy that the young person is safeguarded. Um, but that sometimes comes with some pain as well. You know, we have to be relentless in our approach. It doesn't just stop because it's got to half past four and, you know, we get to go home and the social workers, you know, got to pick up on the rest of it. It doesn't work like that. We have to be absolutely relentless in that approach. And is there any uh, specific barriers because the children may have additional needs when it comes to reporting concerns? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the young people, you know, as I said before, we work really hard to build truly authentic healing relationships with young people that cross our threshold. That is really difficult to lend that relationship to other professionals that want to come in and speak to that young person. Yeah, They've often had really negative experiences of other multi-agencies. Um, in particular, they see social workers quite more often than not as the enemy you know there's that 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 old narrative of social workers only here because they take me away from mum and dad and they make everything worse and we have to lend our relationship as professionals and safe people to our other multi agency colleagues to show that we are all here because we care and there is not one person that does or doesn't care within this relationship so to break down that that barrier and truly advocate and be alongside that young person is is a massive piece of work that we have to do, um, but with one of those pieces of work that gets the greatest outcome as well. Yeah. So um, if you had to give advice to um, mainstream schools on safeguarding children with SEND needs, what would that be? I think first and foremost, it would just be to be patient. You know, and it's it's really difficult because, you know, some of the schools locally to us are, are, are considerably bigger. You know, our pupil cohort specifically where I am at the minute is, is 40 young people versus our nearest school, which is a thousand. Yeah. And it must be really difficult in that moment to be patient and to give the young people specifically what they need to allow them to be safe. But it is really, really important. Mm. You know, we I'd like... also. Okay, sorry. Go on. sorry, go on. No, you please go on. I was just saying, and I liked your advice earlier about showing action, doing action more than just saying. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, really important. I think as well, you know, some I, 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 sit, I sit and work with the inclusion team specifically to the area that I work in. Um, and I'm somewhat astonished sometimes by the application of their behavioural policies in terms of how it impacts upon some of the young people with SEND needs. Um, I think that colleagues within mainstream schools and, you know, policy and guidance hampers it to a certain extent whereby, you know, we're looking for a behaviour Nevada in terms of everything's brilliant, you know, everyone's skipping down the corridor, nice, safe, calm spaces. And that just isn't always the way, especially for these young people that just simply don't know how to be. You know, they don't have those communication skills. They have purely identified needs that say that they just can't do it. Yet what we do more often than not is bring a stick and we punish those young people. You know, Tom Bennett talks about different behaviours in terms of categorising to three, three areas whereby behaviour where they cannot choose linked to their SEND needs, behaviour they can choose, but they just choose not to, or behaviour that is environmentally impacted you know young people being at home and swearing because parents carers are swearing mm. and that's really important and I always reflect on that and try and reflect on that at, at sort of end of day debriefs with colleagues to make sure that we are taking appropriate action while being in line with policy mm. to make sure that that is presented well to our young people 
I think as well, I'd always, uh, you know, ask colleagues to remain inquisitive, you know, and it's difficult because you don't have that sort of nuclear relationship as we do with 40 young people. Mm. But the power of connection is so important to these young people. If you're in a school of, you know, a thousand people, and you know you have a teacher or a member of staff that you can identify as a safe person who will always be there for you it will make a massive difference to that young person and especially if that member of staff is being inquisitive you know is asking what is happening wondering why it's happening and really thinking about what that specifically means to the young person yeah. that's really important you also mentioned earlier a book. What was that book you mentioned earlier? Mine now. Oh, said- Carl Rogers' Core Conditions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Carl Rogers' Core Conditions is a um, therapeutic approach, um, and there's there's quite a lot of literature out there in on, on the internet. Um, it's really interesting. It looks at um, unconditional positive regard regard of the young people. It looks mm-hmm. at um, congruence, which is that effectively what you say you're going to do and being very empathetic and curious. Yeah, so would you recommend that for people? Oh, a- absolutely. That coupled alongside th- that trauma-informed pra- uh, UK model of wine and um, looking at pace, those three things combined help, in my mind, to create some really emotionally available adults. Excellent, thank you. So I've got some quick fire questions for you now. So what are your top three non-negotiables for safeguarding? Yeah, I think a lot of these we would have already covered, but they're, yeah. they're really, really pertinent. So firstly would be to be available and be available in its truest sense. So you're not just available because your doors open. You are there and available because you are emotionally available. You know, you, you're there. You're not you're not judging. You're just being a, truly alongside The second for me would be to act when you say you're going to act. You know, when you say you're going to do something, whether that be something good or something bad, you know, if someone's misbehaved and we have to make a call home or we have to put a sanction in place, act when you say you do that, because that creates a level of consistency and the young people gain to recognise, okay, so if I do this, then I know that this will happen. And that holds them psychologically safe. I think number three is it's really important to hold yourselves and others to account. I think that when an incident has happened or is happening, it's really important to sit back and reflect in terms of making sure that we have done everything that we can do to safeguard our young people and our families. And where that isn't the case, we need to look inwards to make sure that, you know, if we've dropped something or if we need to do something better that we do it. But where the other professionals, you know, other multi agencies haven't done something appropriate, then we need to make sure we are equally holding them to account as much as possible, too. Thank you. I think they are really good top threes, to be fair. Um, And so the last quick fire question I'm going to ask you is what is the best lesson anyone has ever taught you? And it doesn't have to be about safeguarding. I think the best lesson anyone's ever taught me is it's not necessarily someone I've met but it's an approach that I really adopted. And it's it's from Rita Pearson in terms of every child needs a champion. And that links, it's very multifaceted to me. It it links into, you know, quality of education, teaching, learning, behaviour, safeguarding. It's everything, but equally just how we interact as adults. Yeah. You know, if you've not seen it, please go go look at it on YouTube. It is absolutely fantastic and it's very thought provoking. And it really instilled into me the reason why I do what I do and the reason why I care so much you know it's really important for us to reflect and recognize that education is more than just a transactional thing it's more than just you turn up and I teach you it's about making a real holistic difference each and every day and truly changing the outcomes for these young people that's great thank you so much and thank you so much for your time today I really do appreciate it and sharing all your great practices and your great advice thank you very much Harry thank you no not a problem thank you for having me